Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our very special patient webinar series uh, sponsored by CNET. We are delighted to have with us today Ronnie Allen, who was diagnosed with metastatic grade two small intestine nets in 2010. He lives with his wife in Hampshire, England, and has a son and daughter and four grandsons. After retiring from his defense-related work in 2014, Ronnie became an independent advocate and blogger for neuroendocrine cancer, winning several awards, including community blog and lifetime achievement. But he also likes to keep himself active and fit. He runs awareness sites on Twitter and Facebook, and his private Facebook support group has almost 7,000 people from across the world all contributing to helping other neuroendocrine cancer patients and caregivers. Ronnie, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I hope uh, everyone can hear me okay. Um, the, um, I'm having to control the slides in a slightly different way than I planned, so there might be a, a bit of a gap between the slides changing, but I'll have to manage that as best as I can. Um, Jackie's introduced me. Um, many of you here will, will probably know me anyway from my various sites, uh, but I'm very pleased to be speaking to um, the Canadian net guys today. Uh, but I understand there might be some other uh, people from other countries as well, which is absolutely fine. The more the merrier. Um, the, uh, the 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 lag will come up in a minute. <laughs> I always put a disclaimer on um, because I tend to go on about stuff that I've just assimilated over the years. And um, I don't want anybody to think that uh, it's it's something that, that you should be taking as medical advice. Uh, and I'm sure you've read that by now. So uh, I'm gonna press the, start to press the buttons early to get the next slide. Um, I think it's important um, and this is something I emphasize in my, my own patient group, is that when we talk to other patients and caregivers, or, or anyone else who's interested in NETS, that we, sh we should always understand that uh, there's a completely uh, big range of different NETS, and, and the, the medical word for that is uh, heterogeneity. heterogeneity. Um, and um, neuroendocrine neoplasms, to use the correct term, are known to be a group of very heterogeneous uh, type of cancers. And so it's important that we understand this when we talk to people, otherwise people get confused. So if I say a net, for example, I tend to mean well differentiated, well differentiated uh, tumor, which can be grade one, two or three based on the new nomenclature. And if I say a neuroendocrine carcinoma, uh, then I mean a poorly differentiated by default high grade. And uh, if I say neuroendocrine neoplasm, it means both of them. But I might also use the term neuroendocrine cancer to mean the same thing. And it's not just the, the, the different grades there that um, uh, are completely different. Uh, it's important to understand that that you're, you could be talking to someone who's got a localized tumor at stage one, and you could be talking to someone who's who's metastatic at, uh, at stage four. So it's important to understand that. And these are some of the questions that I ask people when they start asking questions, because you just can't answer properly unless you know these facts. Um, and some people have a functional tumor, i.e. a syndrome, and some people don't. Um, some people are hereditary tumors, and, and but most of us will not be and it's important to understand these as well for context uh, as we go forward the um i'm going to start with my my story my own story which goes back to 2010 although in hindsight it probably started before that but i just wasn't paying attention um i i had a chat with a nurse a routine appointment at, at my local gp um and uh, it was it was actually an annual asthma clinic that i go to and um she says anything else to tell me and i said i think i've lost a bit of weight and she said do you did you mean to lose the weight and, and that statement there sort of triggered everything in my life up to and including this webinar um the uh she sent me some blood tests and i uh, wasn't even interested in doing them and i 
took me three weeks to get them. But once I got them, it was discovered that I had quite low hemoglobin and they tested them again and it was even lower. And the GP, when he saw me, says, um, I wasn't expecting to see such a, a well looking guy with these hemoglobin scores, which I normally only see in very senior people who are not eating properly. Um, so that was a bit of a shock. Um, I, I, I had a colonoscopy in 2008 for, to be, it was it was something simple like my, my stool went black for a few days, and uh, but that was completely negative. And uh, I had been flushing and all that kind of stuff, uh, and a bit of diarrhea, but I just put it down to getting old, something I've eaten, whatever. I was too busy working, you see, and um, so. When that, when that nurse uh, uh, and then the GP said, we're going to refer you to an anemia clinic because you've got signs of iron deficiency anemia, I had yeah, completely dismissed that. It'll be something and nothing. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, I went away on holiday <laughs> to Barbados, would you believe, and uh, came back and there was an appointment. It was like another six weeks ahead. And I said, well, I'm just going to go and use my work insurance, something maybe I should have done in the first place. Um, and I had an appointment in 48 hours and they did a scan and boom, that was it. I was a metastatic cancer patient. They didn't know which one, uh, but a week later they found out via a liver biopsy and uh, that's how it all started basically. You know, I didn't even feel well, unwell. I was just not a normal self. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's when, I, when I think back, uh, I, I've got a, a thousand questions. I, I, I love to have asked at the time. Um, but I hit the postcode lottery because um, there was a, a, a burgeoning uh, net MDT that was evolving uh, in in my area that was only 16 miles away. And the oncologist that I saw local was was actually part of it, uh, part of the wider team. And, and he said, you know, you're going to need surgery, I can tell you that now. And we've got one of the top guys in UK. So I kind of felt lucky in that respect. And, and it sort of uh, relaxed me slightly on, on at least what they were going to do to me it was going to be something that needed to be done. Um, and But he said, I'm going to do a bunch of tests first because uh, we need to know more. And so I said, let's go. And, and off we went. And and then <clears throat> this is at the end of, 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 uh, of July. And it took... Um, sorry, I've got this lag going on with my slides because of technical issues. Um, we, I did, you know, I did so many tests in in August. I just, I just couldn't believe how many tests I was getting. Uh, but I knew that the uh, chromogranin A or CGA and 5HIAA uh, were the important ones. Uh, and I also got a nuclear scan called an octreotide scan. It was the old version before we had the gallium scans. And I started to think after about four or five weeks of just doing tests, I started to think that the, the, when are they going to actually do something? Uh, but the beauty of 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 a, of a low grade or well differentiated net is you you've got time to get the ducks in the line, and I think people need to to to, uh, to remember that. And it's better to get things right than to launch into something which is which is wrong and and can do harm. Um, the um, the when they found out that my octreotide scan did show the tumours as per the CT scan, i.e. Uh, my uh, receptors were working, I was octreotide avid. As they called it, um, I then they then give me uh, octreotide daily injections because I was having these symptoms of flushing, which I now knew why, um, and there was some explanation to the uh, to the to the erratic and infrequent burst of diarrhoea that I was experiencing. No longer did I think I'd been eating something. Funny thing is, it was only happening at the weekends when I wasn't at work. I still haven't worked that one out yet. Um, I met the surgeon eventually and he said, I'm going to give you a hard year. And he was a surgeon who believed in an aggressive approach to uh, getting rid of nets. And I now know 11 years later that there's quite a lot of surgeons who, who feel the same way. Um, I had a quick uh, liver embolization in uh, October. Uh, and then I finally got surgery in November. Um, so I had the classic small intestinal net surgery, so the uh, three feet of uh, terminal ileum, small intestine, and the right hemicolectomy. But I also had, a, a, and a bunch of lymph nodes, 
an army of lymph nodes as well. But I also had this bizarre thing that they spotted on CT, um, which was I had fibrosis. Now that's common in, in nets. You could have a, it's carcinoid heart disease or Hedinger syndrome is what I prefer to call it. Um, and you can have it in the mesentery, which I also had some of that as well, but it, it wasn't uh, causing any obstructions or anything. But I had it in the retroperitoneal cavity, which is less common than the other two, uh, but it is a thing. And um, worryingly, um, it was uh, that there's two major blood vessels going up, up and down your body, uh, into the heart and out the heart. And, and one of them's called the aorta and one of them's called the inferior vena cava. And, and these, this fibrosis had fused those two vessels together. And this kind of spooked my surgeon because he's obviously saw a long-term risk in that. And so uh, he spent a long time doing that part of the operation, which total lasted nine hours, uh, which is quite long for a small intestine, uh, classic small intestine surgery. Um, after that, uh, they gave me landriotide. Um, I'm actually due one tomorrow, number 140 something. Um, can't remember the exact amount. <clears throat> um, as a follow-up scan in January 2011, it was noticed I had some blood clots on my lungs and I started anticoagulants injections, which was a complete pain in the arse. Um, uh, but eventually, after about one and a half thousand of them, I moved to a small pill. And I'm still on that today as a side effect from my cancer. Uh, he promised me a hard year and uh, he got me back in in uh, April uh, 2011. And we did a liver resection, took about two thirds of my liver. Um, and uh, that was by Keyhole. Uh, he was an expert on Keyhole, so he was quite happy to do that. Um, he wanted to give my liver, he couldn't get everything from my liver, uh, and he wanted to give it a burst of uh, chemo uh, liver embolization a couple of months after, but that was aborted because the, the interventional radiologist could not get there safely. Uh, but in hindsight, it, it wasn't an issue anyway, because I'm still here. The, uh, in 2012, uh, my chromogranin, chromogranin A uh, elevated slightly and uh, they checked the odd findings which are above the diaphragm i.e. above the above the chest um, in that I had things lighting up uh, on in my uh, left armpit or left axillary nodes lymph nodes as they're called and also in my uh, clavicle nodes big long big long name they've got SCF nodes and um, they decided that uh, I, I got referred to uh, a surgeon who worked with my oncologist who did a lot of breast cancer surgery. So he was the uh, a champion guy for, for lymph nodes under the armpit and, and, and in the general area above the chest uh, where a lot of um, breast cancer patients uh, get lymph node metastases. So he could, he could feel one lymph node by hand, it was palpable in my armpit. So he said, right, well, you need to cut these out. So um, I went in January uh, 2012 in February, very short notice op, much to the joy of my employer. Um, and he took out uh, nine nodes from my armpit, five tested positive from net, which is my surgeon, just my own surgeon, big, uh, who did the big stuff. He just couldn't believe I had a, a positive net in my armpit. Um, the, the five nodes he took out of my clavicle, he, he described that as an explore, exploratory biopsy uh, rather than surgery. Um, they all tested negative, uh, which was bizarre. Um, they still light up today, so go figure. Um, the, in 2013, uh, just when I, I thought everything had been squared away, I have a, a quite a large thyroid lesion which they checked back on all my other scans and it was something that was there, but very, very faint on my first octreotide scan, for example. But thyroids have a habit of lighting up on um, somatostatin receptor scans. Um, nonetheless, it's quite a large lesion and it's starting to affect my thyroid levels. 
Um, so we, uh, I'm on another pill. What's another one going to do to me? Um, the so I'm starting to get a bit worried about this case because things keep popping up all over the place. And uh, but apart from all of that, law, I'm actually okay. Um, and and that's how I felt at the time. Um, I wanted to be positive, but these things uh, kept kept cropping up. And I guess, judging by the stories that I see in my own patient group, um, that that's quite a common thing for people to feel. And um, you know, I, I I keep saying to myself, how on earth can a cancer cause all that damage in my body, um, both before diagnosis and then damage that has to be done? To, to, to get rid of as many cells as possible after I've been diagnosed. And yet it didn't actually let me know until an inquisitive nurse gave me a blood test. But again, I see so many similar stories and uh, normally snow but sneaky was the, is the title of uh, my most viewed blog, which has got about 55,000 at this point. Um, I have to say, as I said, I was getting a bit worried at the time when all these things kept cropping up and uh, all the side effects that I had uh, from the treatment as well as the, the cancer. And I actually did cross my mind that I actually might not uh, make it uh, on this journey. Uh, I, you know, I, it might happen sooner than 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 I think. And um, and I started to. Um, think how can I how can I move away from these thoughts and I, I suddenly said I need to completely change the way that I live my life because um, I'm, I was a bit of a workaholic before I was diagnosed and I thought that my new normal should be getting back to my old normal and and in the end um, so I didn't realize my phone would go off nobody ever phones me on Sunday But do you know what? You know who's calling me now? It's my nurse for my injection tomorrow. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm coming back. <clears throat> All right. Sorry about that. Uh, I wanted to get rid of my phone. I should have done that in the first place. Um, I wanted to find out how I could move on from this um, feelings and, and, and I need to change my life. So what I decided to do was, was take early retirement uh, for work and, and start to focus on me and my family instead of focusing on my work. You know, I was the kind of guy who would do a 12 hour day and not think anything of it. Um, similarly, um, you know, I, I, I log on at weekends and work if I needed to. So I need. I, I decided that uh, I'd done some maths, or math as you guys might say, and, and worked out that I, I could retire at 59, which I was at the time. And uh, I'd actually always had a long-term plan to retire at 60. Uh, and But had it not been for the cancer, I guess I might have still been working now. Sometimes I do feel like I'm working, the kind of things I do nowadays. But um, I started to, um, this is not my quote, but it, it actually fits exactly how I was feeling at the time. And I, I know that some of you guys like this uh, picture when you see it. Um, and did you read it again? I know I have, about a thousand times. Oh my God, this nurse is determined to get a hold of me. Just give me a minute, please. My apologies. Um, so, in my um, one of the things that I did initially, within a month of of retiring, um, was to uh, dig out a leaflet uh, that I had out of a Sunday newspaper in 2002. Would you believe uh, that uh, it was about Hadrian's Wall? And I thought I, I said back in 2002, I'd love to do this. And um, so I said, I'm going to dig, dig it out. And, and, and I started to plan this walk. And uh, um, as, as soon as I said I was going to do it, my wife, Chris, um, who's now part of the team, um, she said, well, I'll, I'll come with you, you know. 
Um, and uh, so what we decided to do was, was was spend about three or four months doing lots of walks uh, and getting ourselves uh, acclimatized to doing you know 17 miles in a day. And so we did a, we did um, six. Uh, th this walk took six days to do, and we went from the, the right hand side, uh, Newcastle, um, and, and followed Hadrian's Wall, which is a 2,000 year old World Heritage Site. Phenomenal uh, to see the bits that are left behind. Um, and we walked all the way to, to Bonus on Solway, which is just over the water from Scotland, and that was a good place to finish for me, being Scottish. Uh, those who have seen the, the Monty Python film will will get the last uh, bit there. Um, and it kind of set me off on um, doing, uh, keeping myself really healthy and keep myself fit so that I could withstand anything else that they, they might want to do to me, uh, which is something which is quite common nowadays when you, there's, there's a new thing where you, when you go to surgery, the, um, they, they get you fit before you do surgery. So that was in the back of my mind. And uh, so I gave up work and that's not my work, that's my, my new work. Um, and those are some of the pictures from the, uh, from the Hadrian's Wall walk. Um, and we had a great time on that. And uh, I would like to do it again, um, but we, we, <laughs> we walked four times the length of the wall just to train for that. Um, but uh, me being ex-military, uh, training is always uh, longer than the actual conflict. Um, I, and I also realized that I actually wasn't going to die. I was actually going to live. So I decided to keep doing these um, walking uh, and adventure things and, and, and looking after myself. And, and I actually started to study um, lots of, uh, I'm laughing because of the title, I've forgotten about that. Um, I just had to study um, how I could best live with this disease and, and I needed to, to know quite a lot. I'm, I'm one of these inquisitive guys that needs to know everything and so I study quite a lot. Um, so after I, after I um, retired from work, the most exciting thing that I did was, was take my 5-inch IAA urine sample when in, in a jug down to the hospital and that's it strapped into the back seat of my car there. And, and the good news is that um, my, my, my tumour markers and my 5-HIAA uh, uh, went into normal levels shortly after all my treatment. And they just haven't budged since. And uh, I know it's, they're not perfect markers, but for me, they're a good sign that everything is, is normal. Um, this, I've been, I, I call myself stable, uh, which is what, my oncologist keeps telling me I am, um, but I still need support and surveillance. And I, the, the reason is, is because I've got a, a stage four cancer. Uh, it's incurable, but it's treatable and manageable, just like a chronic disease, in my opinion, and many other people who, who make that statement. And, uh, and so I kind of um, religiously do the old uh, uh, surveillance thing. I, I'm, I, I get looked after by a multidisciplinary team who have got access to, I've got my own net nurse who I speak to frequently and, and, and dietitians and stuff like that. So I kind of make sure that I'm uh, speaking to those guys all the time, letting them know what's happening. Um, and uh, that works a treat uh, in my MDT. Um, the, the thyroid uh, thing came back a bit. It started to, to um, show bigger on CT scans. And so what they did is they refer me back to the guy who did my uh, lymph node removal. Um, he was also apparently a bit of an expert on thyroids. Um, but, and, but he was working for the, um, working with, sorry, the, the endocrinology team because um, they didn't know if this was net. Um, and so he did several biopsies on me and every single one was inconclusive. There's no sign that this is net at all. So this just might be a second uh, benign cancer type issue going on. Um, lots of people have uh, nodes. I think this is slightly bigger than a node, what I've got, but a lot of people have nodes in their thyroid, which, which you know, are pretty common in the general population when you're above 50, apparently. Uh, some people have more than one. Um, 
but because it's an endocrine organ, they, they, they keep an eye on this really closely. And I, I was going to two clinics there. I was going to my neck clinic. I was going to an endocrine clinic uh, every three months for, for about a year and a half. And eventually um, he said, you know, unless you want me to cut it out, which I'm happy to do, um, there's not much more I can do here. So uh, he referred me back to uh, the MDT and they, they just uh, monitor it on, on scans. Um, CT scan really. It still lights up on my nuclear scans, but not intense uptake. Um, I, I now take a, a thyroxine sup. It's a very small tablet. Take it in the morning. Uh, it's not a problem at all. And, and my levels went back to normal after taking that, so that's fine. Uh, as I said earlier, I changed from injection to a twice a day tablet. That was a, you would not believe a, a change in my quality of life just by changing to a tablet. Um, I, I had to take this injection to work with me. And sometimes I'd be in a hotel overnight sticking this needle in my stomach, which looked like I'd been I'd done 10 rounds with Mike Tyson. It's just black and blue and yellow. It, just, it, was, it was really bad. Um, the um, 2018, I changed oncologists, not because of any anything uh, sinister uh, it's because my old guy retired um, and I had to get a new guy who who's um, who's uh, really good and he started to look at my scans in detail and he says I'm not happy that uh, this retroperitoneal fibrosis issue you've got is quite close to your ureter I think it's my left one um, and he said that's potentially going to cause you a quality of life issue over time. So, so he sparked off uh, a lot of work, which involved, uh, I, had to go, I had to then go to the headquarters of the MDT, speak to my old surgeon who uh, gave an opinion about it. Um, they, they spoke to a renal expert who said, uh, who recommended to do a special kidney scan um, which is called um, uh, a MAG-3 or something like that. But I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, the, I also got uh, out of that work because of this fibrosis. They, they gave me another, uh, they gave me my very first, actually, uh, Gallium 68 PET scan, which I was pleased about. Um, they added me to the uh, Bone Match Club after that. Uh, I apparently it's I have almost definitely got a net on my limbs right rib, but I have no symptoms at all from that. No pain, nothing. So I just kind of wait to see what happens. Uh, the clavicle areas that they took five nodes out of still lights up. Intense uptake. Uh, normally something that would be a, they would consider a net, but uh, I think it's just reactive nodes. Uh, physiological uptake um, and even more nodes light up in this area here everything's on the left with me um, and they've got some faint stuff going on in areas which were subjected to uh, surgery back in 2010 when they removed my primary and uh, in 2011 when they removed my secondary but I've always known that my surgeon could not get everything uh, out uh, it's debulking surgery, which is mean get as much as you can. Um, the so the so although I'm feeling a lot better about my situation, um, things that again are are, are cropping up uh, all the time. Um, the to be honest with you, the retroperitoneal fibrosis thing is probably the thing that worries me most because of the 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 blood vessels that it's close to and and the. The fact that it's close to a ureter as well is 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 uh, slightly worrying because uh, you know there's a quality of life issue here. But I don't seem to be having any issues at all. My blood tests are fine, the scans are fine, and so hopefully uh, it's where it is now and where it will be forever, so to speak. Um, but a reminder of that: um, the the diagnostic scan said that there was a this abnormal tissue surrounding the mid and distal aorta, uh, and it's up to 15 millimeters thick. I mean, the 50 millimeters is, you know, it's it's like, it's it's quite a bit. It's it's, it's uh, and and all and that. God knows how long that had been been growing 
in my alongside my aorta. Um, the uh, the MTD, the, the MTD said that uh, worst case would be surgery, which would be a big surgery because to get to that particular area is not only a big op, it's also a risky op because of the uh, things that are there. But when the, uh, the renal expert said, do this scan, it was, a, it was like a PET scan and it was uh, especially for kidney functions. Uh, it, they told me that my kidney, one was 60%, one was 40%. Now apparently that's pretty normal. Nobody has 50-50. And so just monitor it for the time being. And I've, I was quite happy with that. Um, so things kept going and going. Now, I have a, a really diligent um, net nurse who uh, likes to um, look after his patients by checking everything that could be a side effect of nets and everything that could be a side effects of the treatment that you get for nets, for example, in my case, lanreotide. Um, and so he does lots and lots of these checks, and I'm going to come on to those in a minute. But one of the things that he started me on was 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 pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, or Creon, as people tend to call it, or technically that's a brand. I started off with that, but I'm on to something called Nutrizim now, and a different brand. I couldn't really get on with the, the crayon. It didn't seem to be doing much for me. Um, I had a mild pneumonia in 2018, in the middle of the year, and it was really bad. I was um, scarier than the net, to be honest. And um, I lost 10 pounds, and I just could not get that weight back on. And it was so noticeable in my face. I, I didn't have the hamster cheeks that I've got now. and um, it wasn't until I started using um, and getting the dosing right on the uh, pancreatic enzymes that I started to put weight back on. And so I kind of stuck to these, I've stuck to these um, capsules for the time being. And uh, so I, I met, a, I met a, a good weight for me. My, uh, I had a bit of a, a diabetes scare in 2000, everything was happening in 2018. It was an interesting year. Um, and uh, so I, um, I had to sort of think about um, what was causing that. Was it lanreotide? Because we know that that can um, play havoc with your blood sugar. Uh, or was it too many biscuits? Um, I don't know. I, I quite like a biscuit with my cup of tea. Uh, I think I'll just stick to that. Um, the, 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 all of a sudden, I started to get all these um, fairly specialist uh, blood tests, although I had had some of them before at my own request due to my own research, and those were the vitamin B12 and um, some of the fat soluble ones, A, A, uh, A D, E, K, uh, in particular D, uh, and that was the advice I got from, from dietitians. Uh, I was also getting the normal ones. Um, I, I moved to um, the 5-HIAA uh, blood test version which is uh, i can tell you now it's a lot better no lugging the jug anymore um and it's a, it's a blood test there's a bit of uh, you know uh, you have to fast for 12 hours but it's better than 72 hours um and uh, the results are, are pretty comparable uh, which is why they're now using it in my net center the um I changed from uh, CT from six months to 12 months, as my oncologist uh, recommended. Uh, he says, you're, you're, you're so stable now that this is what you should be doing. Less scan, the less scan you're doing, the better. Um, I had another um, gallium 68 PET scan last year, um, and that was more or less the same as they found last time, but even more activity up here. I don't know what's going on there. I think it's a lot of... Uh, reactive stuff to be honest but uh, they're not too worried about it either um, which is pretty good but all of these things that keep cropping up um, it, it's a, it does sometimes feel like I'm, I'm doing this but it just seems more manageable today than it, than it was at the beginning and I suppose you can say that I'm, I'm kind of starting to, to learn to live with the disease um, and so basically that's that's my sort of patient net story but i wanted to go on about uh, perspectives and um 
how I cope and uh, what views I have on on the way that uh, you can improve yourself and improve your quality of life with with net. I'm not saying that it's going to be something that will work for you, um, but I think there's a lot there's a lot of things that we can do for ourselves um, as we as we move out of that things are not so scary sort of phase. Um, you know me as a blogger. Um, I'm also an uh, independent advocate and an award-winning patient leader. Um, uh, I must be doing something right on some of the things that I push out. Um, one of the um, thing, one of the reasons I um, started um, up with a blog, um, apart from fundraising for my Hadrian's Wall Walk, which is the real reason that I set it up. Um, but I also got quite excited about some of the stuff I was learning about nets. And um, and, and I found that, that being a patient um, helps you understand uh, things about cancer. And, and uh, as this slide says, you know, doctors might be the experts in, in cancer, but you're the expert in, in how you has affected you and how you have to live with it and the things that you've, you've got to put up with. And so there's stories to be told about that. And um, some of the, you know, there's an example of, I've got 410 blogs out there. Um, I cringe when I look at the ones I did at the early days, uh, but some of, some of my newer ones uh, are, are very polished uh, and, and only taking from, from uh, good sources, unless it's marked opinion, of course, uh, which I have on many things. But um, there's a, a sample there of some of the more popular ones um, um, and people seem to, to like them. I do believe that everybody um, should advocate for themselves or advocate for their loved one if they're a, a caregiver um, or someone who's supporting that particular patient. Um, so self-advocacy, uh, which could also mean getting someone to do it for you, um, it's really important and and one of the things that, that comes out in my patient group and, and not just for me but from hundreds and thousands of people is that if it's any way possible see a net specialist uh, and what's becoming more popular in certainly in the large countries in terms of distance is is um, a doctor who's willing to work with a net specialist so that they can both do their part of the deal uh, and I see that that's becoming more popular, uh, particularly in countries which are large in size, such as Canada, Australia, USA, and some others. Um, you, you really need to advocate for yourself and people need to speak up. Because um, if you don't, um, you, you may not get your message over properly. Um, it's always useful to know your baseline diagnosis and, and then track it going forward. And, and if you haven't done that, it might be something that you you can do um, in hindsight and, and build up and, and look at stuff and say, you know, actually, that's getting better. I didn't realise that. Um, the um, always ask questions. I mean, I, I prepare a list of questions before I go to see my oncologist. Now, I ask for any reports on me before I go there. It's something that I actually demand, and then I base my questions on what I'm what I'm seeing, what I'm reading, and then um, I, I just launch into these questions. and and, I, and I'm conscious that there's someone behind me in the queue to see my cards. I don't, so I don't, I don't kick the bottom out of it. Uh, but never be afraid of uh, of appearing foolish. And you know, even doctors um, will say to people, I mean, I've had doctors say to that. No question is stupid. Ask your question, um, and don't be afraid of of healthcare professionals. I mean, I come from a um, a generation and the generation before me as well, where where doctors spoke and you listened, and uh, and I think that things are changing where you you need to be speaking to a doctor, and they expect that as well. They expect you to to question things, um, and and never be afraid of them, and and and. And but be afraid if you think the doctor's talking rubbish, which hopefully doesn't happen a lot. Um, net patients are so on the ball about nets, and um, 
the some of them um lots of them know more than maybe many doctors out there um and the other thing about um mark and mark everybody the doctor wants to tell you about your marker test or your cga five yeah etc but um uh, nowadays, I want to know about quality of life markers and uh, how, you know, what are my other scores on the doors? How is my uh, lipids, my lipids? How is my um, my vitamins and stuff like that? Because those are going to things that are going to affect quality of life. And I'm quite pleased that the um, things are getting better on that score. There's there's more and more multidisciplinary teams, more and more next specialists more and more dietitians, more and more nurses all know about this kind of things and these things are starting to uh, get looked after and so 11 years on um, I'm quite relaxed about living with nets now um, I know that uh, it may come back to bite me in the bottom one day but you know when I get to that bridge that's the point I will cross that bridge and not until then um, and so I'm just going to continue. Um, I quite like the idea of these things called a cancerversary. Um, and I've set my milestone, the next one, at 70. Now, that's, that sounds a bit risky. That's another four years ahead. But the reason that 66 was a big one for me, because it was the day I got my state pension, something I've been paying into since the year dot. And I was determined as a Scotsman uh, to get some of my return on my investment, which I'm now enjoying. Um, and, and long may that continue. Um, and I shall keep climbing hills. Um, so living with neuroendocrine cancer for me is about risk. What is my appetite for risk? And the reason I made this slide up is um, because some of the conversations that I was in online were people were scared to even go out their house and that is completely ridiculous uh, to be honest and, and people need to start assessing risks properly um, and it's what risk are you prepared to accept and what are the benefits and does the benefits outweigh the risk and that I mean I, I, it's easy for me to say that because I come from a, a background at work where I was doing that kind of thing for a living obviously it wasn't the benefit and risk of my own life but it was a similar concept. Um, and so I look to manage my risks when I go out now. Um, and that is things that I take with me. I, you know, I've, I've got a tablet box full of digestive enzymes in case I suddenly decide that, well, I, I want to eat and stuff like that. And that's what I mean by that is, is uh, assess the risks and then try to offset those risks by mitigating actions. Um, clearly, if the benefit uh, is higher than, than the risk, then I need to think about that. That's my own decision then. It's something I've, I've, I've got to decide for myself. Um, but you can uh, uh, manage the risks quite successfully if you think about how things affect you uh, when they do happen. And so uh, I quite like this, this slide, this picture I found on the internet. And uh, I thought that really suits uh, my part of the slideshow because um, this mouse knows that if he gets that cheese it, he might have, he have a headache and so uh, so he wears uh, he takes mitigating actions and, and wears a crash helmet and so it, it might hurt a little bit but not as bad without it and he gets the cheese and so you, you can you can apply that uh, scenario there to to many things uh, in net maybe Maybe things to do with food, for example. And of course, it's also, it's not just about risk appetite, it's about food appetite. And no single diet works for everyone. Uh, common question, I've, I, I've got nets, what should I eat? So, you know, cue 1,000 questions about what type of net he's got, what survey he's had, what's he did, is he or not smart, start and analog, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so my simple answer to that is the diet that works for you uh, is the one that is the, the best diet for you is the one that works for you um, and you know example pancreatic nets might have completely different dietary issues than a small intestine net. Um, so uh, one of the things that I started uh, when I retired from work is I start and was something I wished I had have done uh, when I was diagnosed was, was keep a diary uh, and, and I keep a diary uh, about what I've had to eat 
uh, how many bowel movements I've had. I can even tell you how many bowel movements I've had in 2021. That's how sad I am. But th this diary uh, that I keep really helps me work out if something's not quite right. Um, weight, that goes on my diary as well. I weigh myself every three or four days. Uh, bear in mind that it was my weight that, kicked, that triggered my, my diagnosis. So I, I kind of do that and, 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 and stay fit as well. Um, and eating is a part of that, to be honest. Um, the next slide um, is uh, you, you try and keep a, a sense of humour. Um, there's a bit of a lag on this one because it's a bigger file. Um, but this, I, I was I was up walking in in Scotland uh, on holiday, and uh, I came across this uh, massive stone table and chairs which hopefully is going to come up soon. <laughs> sorry, Chip. Sorry, guys. It's uh, it's not coming up. I can see it on my slideshow, but it's not coming up on the screen yet. Ah, there it is. Um, so, um, and, and, and me being a bit of a joker, um, I decided to, to get a picture taken with this. Uh, this was in uh, the middle of Scotland in some big forest somewhere in uh, up north, and um, the first thing I immediately thought of of the Flintstones, obviously, and um, I, I and and it, and it was something that, that there was a bit of a laugh at the time. Um, but it's all to do with we normally take a flask and sandwiches, as some of you may know, when we go out walking. But we didn't have one that day. But had I had a flask and sandwiches with me that day. This is where we would have had our lunch. Um, conquering fear is is something which I think I've conquered it now. As I said, I, I had those thoughts very early on, uh, but I'm really calm about the whole situation now. I, I've got a good team behind me. I, I feel OK. Um, I'm eating well, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I don't have too many symptoms. Um, and all the ones that I, that I had are gone, and all the ones that I bother me now are, are basically a result of surgery and stuff like that. But I think um, what you've got to start with, you have to accept their diagnosis. You can't go around saying, why me, why me, oh, this is a mistake. You've just got to um, um, accept it uh, once it's all been confirmed and, 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 and plan uh, the way ahead. And the way ahead may not be in a straight line. Um, it might be there might be twists and turns and it might be bumpy but you know that's that isn't that like general life anyway uh, you need to identify your triggers that are causing some of the things that for you to worry and and for this is different for everyone i mean you know for young people with families i i can't imagine what you know they've got issues with how their kids going to cope uh, if they're not there and that's a real heartbreaking thing when I see that on a Facebook group uh, and uh, but uh, it's better to talk about it um, the number of times that people post for the first time in a patient group and you can almost feel the relief uh, in in the way that they've spoken and and their reactions to the comments that they get in response to it and and I think it makes feel people feel better and, and they're not alone and it's not just them that's having these issues. Um, social media is a hugely powerful tool. For me it is. Uh, for some it's not. Um, I have people coming and going in my group all the time. Uh, it's always good to see them come back um, um, and, and be patient. I mean I remember if you remember my first couple of slides uh, when I seemed to be doing spending all my life doing tests and not getting any treatment um, that's because sometimes uh, it's worth the wait um, and uh, to get all the ducks in the line and get treated. So, so be patient. Uh, it's going to be a long journey. And, and try to focus on wellness as well as illness. Um, and, and that's quite difficult for some people who are suffering a bit more than others. And, uh, you know, there's so much help in patient groups and, and in organisations such as Cath uh, Jackie's. Uh, to help people who are, are struggling at this point in time. And hopefully these things pass eventually 
and and you know if you're still struggling after all this help that you can get from uh, uh, advocate organisations and in patient groups, then you know there's there's no shame in seeking counselling, and there's some good people out there who uh, understand what cancer patients go through, and and in my um, article eight tips for conquering fear, that was the eight tips there. There's some uh, an excellent uh, two excellent videos in there uh, of people who do that for a living. They, they talk to cancel cancer patients, and you know this slide here is is might be something that that is all you need. Um, it's a way of thinking, and and you know I see this day in day out on a patient group that that there's always the assumption that the slightest glitch that you have in your body and it's the cancer coming back it's it's the cancer well, and you know most of the time it probably isn't um and this slide is gives me real perspective when i look at it every time i look at it don't sweat the small stuff now it's quite difficult to work out what the small stuff is but you do learn as time goes on believe me um and you know, not everything is connected to nets. And the next slide, when it comes up, um, you will see um, a, a quote that I use all the time from the well-known Dr. Lou from from USA. Uh, that, uh, and when he said it, I jump for joy because it's something that I say as well. And uh, so I use I use it because he's an expert, and people uh, tend to listen to what he's got to say. That even net patients get regular diseases um, we would say normal in UK but I'll speak your lingo today um, but it's it's something that uh, we need to hoist in and, and, and especially you know the average net patient is not a, a young person there are young people getting it but the average net patient is not a young people and when you get older you your body starts to to break down and things fall off and stuff like that so you're going to get normal issues anyway um, you know I, I've got um, really painful fingers on this hand and it, it's not net arthritis it's regular arthritis and it's a very difficult jigsaw net because there are certain things which look like regular diseases um, but um, they're not or they might be and you know the conquering fear thing is a real mental challenge and finding um, the enthusiasm or the motivation to go and do stuff is a challenge for many. I can see that day in, day out in my patient group. But sometimes you've just got to draw a line like I did in 2013 and draw a line. That's it. I'm, I'm going to start uh, learning about this disease and I'm going to start looking after me um, instead of my employer. Um, and I'm uh, sometimes I, I like to. Ha I've got this uh, um, saying that sometimes you you've got to climb that hill, um, and it's a metaphor. Um, but for me, it actually is climbing a hill. Uh, but I don't mean that for for everyone um, because it's quite tough climbing hills, and it, and and even at my age, it's uh, uh, it's taken me a long time to be able to 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 do what I do for the last sort of five six years i've just been doing more and more and more of it and uh i, I can I'm, i climb some big hills now and, and as you know don't try this at home so when i say oh i've just climbed up a big hill i don't mean that you have to do it as well but what i um what i said in this little um this was posted on a site uh called mcmillan which is a big uk cancer support um, charity, which I, I was once involved with, and it got quite a lot of um, I got quite a lot of attention. Uh, and Macmillan asked me if it's okay if they put it in their book booklets that they hand out. So fine. But the, the the bit that I've highlighted in yellow is the important message for you. It doesn't matter about how fast you can go and how high you can climb a hill, and how far and long you can walk for. Um, the important thing is the direction it's going forward. Um, and and you know, I you know if you walk around your garden. I mean, um, given what's going on at the moment, uh, or maybe not so much now, but uh, during the earlier lockdowns for us, uh, 
when we were confined to uh, to home a lot of the time, the garden was really the only place. Um, and it was quite nice to go out there. Um, so it's kind of a way of thinking for me um, that I've got, I've got my mindset into that way of thinking. Um, and, and I'm just about to summarise uh, that way of thinking now. Um, and, you know, learning, become more active mentally and physically. My blog keeps me going mentally. Uh, running a support group keeps me going mentally. I'm sure Jackie maybe feels the same way. Um, start a diary. I'm still doing it today. It's I've got sheafs and sheafs and sheafs of paper uh, with this diary going back to 2013. Experiment with your uh, diet nutrition. I still make slight changes based on this now. Uh, advocate for yourself and others. Some people who are regular contributors to my patient group, um, they hardly ask a question about themselves, but they're quite happy to help others. And I'm sure they get quite a thrill out of that um, and, and it makes them feel better. So there's the mental challenge coming out there. Um, find a hobby. Well, I've kind of got this hobby called blogging um, and you can add your own ones to that. Uh, but always know your limits. Um, I forgot my limits once or twice going up hills and uh, thought I was going to keel over. Um, uh, risks are inevitable, which is why I always have toilet paper in my backpack. Um, and uh, so I don't worry about being near a toilet. I know some people, for some people, that's a big issue. Uh, I don't sweat the small stuff and find some nice scenery. I, I just, you know, when I, um, when I go and see some of the places I go and see, this one in this picture is a famous location in Glen Ative, which is adjacent to Glencoe in Scotland. And it's at the site of a famous uh, part of the film, the James Bond film, Skyfall, where C and James Bond were looking down that valley. And there's a picture of James Bond's Aston Martin in the, in the picture. Uh, it, that's the exact spot there. And it's such a beautiful place. And um, I actually forgot that I had any illness at all when I was there. Um, and so my advice to you is not only get out and do some exercise, but try and find somewhere with nice scenery to do it. Because for me, that is double bubble mental challenge. It's the physical challenge plus the mental side. It's, it's so nice to look at scenery. And to be honest with you, I'm still moving on from this because I'm trying to improve my life all the time. Um, and, and, you know, this is I work very closely with my my net nurse and my, my net dietitian um, to to improve stuff. And, and one of the things that I was able to do uh, when I retired was get proper sleep. I used to get up at quarter to five in the morning and, and drive for two hours uh, on a lot of days, not all days, but a lot of days. And then. You know, I get home at eight o'clock at night and fall asleep straight away. Um, and I don't do that anymore. Um, but that was my job and uh, they paid me to do that. And and uh, I do miss the money. Um, but um, I don't have a picture with this one. Um, I didn't want you to see me in my pyjamas. Um, I do. Uh, I, I walk all the time, uh, except when there's other things going on. Uh, I've got a bit of a knee problem at the moment, which is uh, nearly gone now. Uh, yeah, that was caused by my hill walking on January the 1st. Oh, uh, sorry, December 31st, uh, when I walked up a big hill and forgot about my limits. I um, I do walk a lot and uh, I, I, I love taking a flask and sandwiches. And if we see a nice spot to uh, to sit down and, and wonder at the scenery, and, and it's just, it just uh, makes me feel a lot more healthier. Um, those are a mixture of, of photographs from different walks. Uh, the middle one is me with my flask, my military flask, which can withstand temperatures of minus 50, um, be hit by a bullet and still won't, it'll still work. And the tea will still be hot that night and all that kind of stuff. That's what it says on the uh, on the brochure, I'm sure. I haven't, I haven't tested some of those yet. Um, and I sat there looking at a, a fantastic view, having a cup of tea and sandwich, and uh, it was really enjoyable. And I also, uh, you probably worked out now that I like a bit of a challenge. 
Um, and so whenever I see something that looks within my limits in some of my uh, magazines that I read um, and um, some of the short holidays that I go on for the purpose of seeing different scenery and walking in different places, then um, that gives me ideas about where I want to go and, and walk. Uh, and these are another few samples of, of some of the walks that I, that I was doing. And uh, the one on the left always makes me laugh because uh, you can't see it. But on the left hand side is a little cafe. And we couldn't, uh, we didn't have a flask and sandwich that day. We worked in the cafe, had a really nice cup of tea and cake, and then came out of the cafe and realised we had to walk up that hill. Uh, so it was a, a, bit, a bit demoralised to begin with, but it's really nice when we got to the top. And on the right hand side, sometimes it rains and you get wet. So in my backpack, I have a waterproof and I crack on. Um, and I love going to the top of hills because it's always a fantastic view. Um, the one at the the one at the top there in the middle uh, is the uh, second or the highest peak in the south of England. It's in Wales, actually. Uh, sorry, the south of England and Wales. Uh, there called Penny Fan where the uh, special forces train because it's quite a big hill and the next slide has got lots of pictures on it so it's taking a while to upload sorry about this uh, we had a bit of a technical glitch and i've had to change from my laptop to my ipad um, and the slides are taking a bit longer to come up um, and I enjoy the adventure side as well and I always like to try and have a laugh and for those of you who follow my uh, Ronnie Allen Facebook page rather than my neuroendocrine cancer Facebook page that's my public pages you probably see these pictures coming up uh, all the time and um, and I hope they make you laugh as much as it made me laugh but um, a lot of them are sites uh, and scenery that I see uh, when I go walking. And most of the walks that I do, uh, most of the short holidays that I do, are obviously uh, with uh, Mrs. A, who's also known as Mrs. Motivator. Um, that's us at the very start of the Hadrian's Wall walk in 2014. Um, the um, there's something called that you've heard of something called the five E's. People get quite excited about this. I no longer get quite excited about this. It's good advice for some, but not everything applies to everybody. And I actually much prefer uh, the other five E's, um, which stand for something which I invented which is uh, exercise your body, entertain your mind, excite your curiosity, eat something naughty and enjoy the day. And for those who follow my, uh, my walks on my Facebook page, um, you, you'll, you'll see these themes coming up um, all the time. Um, that was another, that was a very short, sharp hill in that picture. But when I got to the top of it, I had to sit down <laughs> Uh, for about 10 minutes to catch my breath and uh, and remember that my hill is a metaphor um, but I do believe that any exercise that you can get is extremely helpful for both body and mind and I think I don't know of any doctor um, that, that doesn't say the same thing uh, about anyone and of course telling your patient story is something else that you might do to cope on, on the, the mental challenge side and um, my, my blog site is a patient story it's patients patients included accredited everything's written by a patient for patients uh, and, it, and it really helped me come come to terms with everything um, and um, I, I'm glad that it helps other people um, my my uh, award-winning blog uh, is there um, in 2022, I will hit 2 million views. When I first started this blog, if you had said to me, you're going to get to 100,000, I would have dismissed it as being a lunatic suggestion. 
Um, so the fact that I, I got to a million was, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. And the fact that I'm going to get to two million this year is just mind blowing. Uh, but I have the two pages there and I, I know that uh, many of you are on there and I'm also uh, quite active on Twitter. For those of you with Twitter, uh, if anybody um, wants these addresses uh, later, I'm sure uh, you can get them. Um, and in my private group, which is a new project for me, it's only a couple of years old, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's suffering from exponential growth and it's keeping me more busy doing this than some of my other things that I've just mentioned. And so i um, sort of struggling a bit to keep everything going at, the, at this point. Uh, I'm very proud to have uh, an admin in my uh, group from Canada, Patricia, and from US, uh, Martha and Mary, and uh, Kirsty from New Zealand, um, who is a field chromocytoma, which I'm also proud to have uh, helping to run my group because I cover everyone, everybody. Um, the Canada as um, on Twitter, I, I follow a uh, very, very intelligent uh, Canadian doctor. She's a surgeon uh, in Toronto and many of you will know her. In fact, she may have operated on some of you. Uh, she's, she's a very smart doctor given what she said on Twitter. Um, and I think she's uh, uh, resulted in an increase of uh, my Canadian following, which I'm very proud of, by the way, um, that I have quite a few Canadians on all of my different sites. Um, and um, I'm nearly there. There's one slide left. And it's one of my favourite sayings. And uh, it always gets a lot of likes when I put this on. Um, and I'm very happy when people join in um, and, and say they're still here too. Um, the, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure talking to you today. Um, it's always been always a pleasure talking to anyone from Canada in, on my Facebook pages or, or my blog site. Uh, or uh, indeed in, in the, the private Facebook group. And so um, if, if I can pass back to, to Jackie now, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I've gone over time, uh, and that's because we had some problems, uh, technical problems, which went on during the presentation uh, because the slides were not coming up as fast as I'd liked and I had to improvise. I tried my best to click and try to gauge how long I'd be talking for so that it would be there when I got to that bit, but it didn't work all the time. So um, if you want to take over, Jackie, that's fine with me. Absolutely, Ronnie. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey with us. And uh, I think it's a rather inspirational story. And also for all of the sage advice. I, I know as a patient myself, I can really relate to uh, a number of the uh, the topics that you touched on and the advice that you gave. So I'm sure that others who are listening uh, also feel the exact same way. So uh, so thanks for sharing some of your wisdom with us uh, and you know your years of um, uh, your journey with this uh, with this cancer. Um, since we have gone over time, I'm going to do a quick call for questions. So if anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat. Uh, but I do have one uh, question for you at this point, Ronnie, uh, that has come in from Cindy, and she says that she's going to be undergoing PRRT treatment, and she wants to know if um, your team has thought about this uh, treatment for you, and if you think there would be any benefit. Um, that, is, that is a great question, because it's a hot topic. Now, the, um, my, my team has mentioned PRRT. In fact, my, my original surgeon, who, who unfortunately doesn't surgeon anymore due to his own issues, uh, but he's a very clever uh, neck specialist and he does consulting now. He has said to me, it's not a matter of um, if you'll get PRT, it's probably a matter of when. So that was a kind of a hint to him um, saying that at some point you, you'll probably need PRT. Um, when I had my... Um, uh, I'm fairly stable now, so I'm not. I haven't got what you would call progressive nets. Mm -hmm. And in UK, 
it tends to be given to someone who's got progressive nets and i'm not really in that category thankfully mm -hmm. at this point um when i had that issue with the um the retroperitoneal fibrosis being quite close to um my left ureter um the one of the things that he said was that um the clearly that retroperitoneal fibrosis is as was caused initially by um elevated serotonin in my pre-diagnostic time because it was there the day it was there on the day i was uh, had my diagnostic scan um because that's what causes it in in the mesentery and also in carcinoid heart or Hedinger syndrome. Um, so they said to me that they think that that one of the, that that growth um, that uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis may have become bigger because of the release of serotonin from para aortic and para cava lymph nodes. Now these are the lymph nodes that run up and down your your two uh, major blood vessels and things are lighting up in that area but i don't have elevated serotonin uh, or via 5hiaa and um in the end the the and and they also took advice from the uh, lead prt physician in the whole of uk who my my surgeon keeps in touch with and said you know is PRRT going to help in this scenario? And she didn't think it would. And so um, it was on it was on the table and it was taken off. Um, but, you know, we wait and see. Now, now my, my surgeon um, thinks I have a miracle case because he is, he is surprised that I haven't had, for example, um, breakouts of more liver metastases over and above what he left behind. Uh, they seem to be stable. They haven't really grown much at all they're not causing me any problems so so i guess i guess um, they have thought about it but not, not ready charging for not ready for it yet and now am i okay thank you ronnie um no other questions at this point i have one comment who says uh, ronnie i appreciate everything you do and all the hard work uh to help and guide others and that's from corey so um, and I'm sure that, you know, you hear that a lot. So um, on that note, since there aren't any other questions, I'm, uh, I'm going to suggest that if anybody does think of any questions that they have for you afterwards, they can either uh, reach out to us or I'm assuming it would be okay for them to reach out to you on the many, um, you know, platforms that you have available. So since you're a very... Uh, the list is long. Bit, right, right, exactly. But you we really appreciate you. <laughs> I can I can well imagine. Um, we really appreciate the time that you've taken today uh, to share your journey with uh, your Canadian friends and and others who have joined. And we really appreciate, uh, as I said before, your insights and to hear about your journey. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, hopefully we'll have another opportunity to uh, to have you join us again. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.